Welcome to The Origin of the Pyramid. The origin of the word pyramid is controversial. Most believe that it originates with the Greek word pyramis, which referred to a bread of conical shape. Life and death in ancient Egypt were modeled on the cycle of the sun. The perfect shape of the smooth-faced pyramid became associated with the metaphor of the pharaoh transformed into one of the sun's rays in death. Pyramids represented the Benben, the primordial mound of the Heliopolitan creation myth. These stories permeated every aspect of Egyptian life to a greater or lesser extent. During the pre-dynastic period, the development of funerary practices was different depending on whether one was located in Lower Egypt or Upper Egypt. Well before the pyramid, there was the burial pits. It is on the site of Marimde Beni Salome in Lower Egypt that we find the oldest funerary site, dating back to 5000 BCE. Study of the tombs revealed that the bodies of the deceased were deposited in a shallow grave in a fetal position. Though a few objects were recovered from these graves, they offered no insight as to the social class of those interred within. In Upper Egypt, pre-dynastic practices are easier to study, but reveal more complex funerary rites. They are divided into two cultural phases, Bedarian and Nagata. The Bedarian phase ranged from 4400 BCE to 3800 BCE. Small necropolises were discovered on the outskirts of villages, revealing the emergence of a funerary cult. The bodies of the deceased were lowered into an oval grave and covered with goat or gazelle skins. Items needed in everyday life were added alongside the body. During the three Nagata periods ranging from 4000 BCE to 3510 BCE, funerary practices evolved in complexity. The shape of tombs changed from oval to rectangular, mimicking the homes of the living. The size of the burials increased and funerary items became more stylized and numerous. Tombs gained complexity with masonry, wooden veneers, or raw bricks added to strengthen the structures. In time, socially stratified necropolises emerged. For example, in Hierakonopolis, the elite and commoners had separate necropolises. The term mastaba, meaning massive bench in dialectal Arabic, refers to a form of funerary architecture that was present in Egypt from the Archaic period to the Middle Kingdom. An evolution of the burial pit, mastabas were generally composed of two parts. A structure was built above the ground in the form of a massive rectangle with stepped walls, and a subterranean burial chamber was located underneath. Smaller mastabas often surrounded the much larger tomb of the king. These generally held the remains of the king's relatives and courtiers. The arrangement of the substructure of the mastaba evolved during the course of the Old Kingdom. From the 5th dynasty onwards, mastabas often featured multi-roomed substructures, with sometimes up to 30 rooms. Also, the quantity and quality of decorated surfaces increased noticeably, as well as the number of statues found within. The Sixth Dynasty would see art used to its utmost. The entire surface of a mastaba would be covered in scenes of daily life, illustrating the prosperity of those lucky enough to comfortably spend eternity near the pyramid of a pharaoh. The best example of this type of mastaba is the tomb of Mararuka in Saqqara.
Welcome to Khufu's Funerary Complex. The Valley Temple was the first architectural component encountered when one entered the funerary complex. It was considered the official entrance of the tomb and mixed the structural components of both a temple and a portico. Khufu's Valley Temple shows evidence of a basalt pavement letting us know where the portico portion of the structure was located. Such a partition is believed to symbolize both the subterranean and solar aspects of the afterlife. Khufu's causeway ran from the floodplain up to the plateau, linking together the valley temple and the mortuary temple. A traditional causeway presented itself as a paved path, enclosed by walls and often roofed. Fragments discovered by archaeologists indicate that the walls in Khufu's causeway, one of the longest known to us, were decorated with carvings and possibly paint. Depictions show a great variety of themes, stars on the ceiling, accompanied by scenes of battles on the walls. Other engravings depicted the creation of the complex by illustrating craftsmen at work. The most impressive private cemeteries of Giza are located east and west of Khufu's pyramid. The eastern cemetery was reserved for members of the royal family, while the western cemetery was mostly set aside for various court dignitaries. In both areas, private tombs, also known as mastabas, were aligned and laid out methodically in streets and avenues. This arrangement was probably an attempt at recreating the king's court for the afterlife. To the east of Khufu's pyramid reside three smaller constructions, the three queen's pyramids. A sloping passage led from the ground surface to a burial chamber, cut out of the bedrock and lined with masonry. If it seems quite certain that these monuments were intended for queen's burials, the identity of the original occupants is hard to assess. The northernmost pyramid was most likely meant for Queen Hete Ferris, who was believed to have been Khufu's mother. However, in 1925, her actual tomb was discovered nearby by accident. It was hidden at the bottom of a deep masonry pit in an underground chamber. Within the concealed chamber, Egyptologists discovered the most complete royal funerary equipment dating from the Old Kingdom, though her body was missing. Within the vicinity of Khufu's pyramid, Egyptologists have uncovered seven boat pits. The exact function of such boat-shaped pits remains unconfirmed, though one can easily conjecture that it was symbolic in nature. The boat pits being located at the eastern side of the pyramid, at the precise spot where the resuscitated king was supposed to reappear, could constitute evidence to support such an assumption. The two southern boat pits, each covered by a roof of huge limestone slabs, were discovered in 1954 by Kamal al-Malak, an Egyptian Egyptologist. Only one of them had been opened. 1,224 boat parts made of cedar wood were retrieved one by one and patiently reassembled by the master restorer Ahmed Youssef. 
This process took 28 years. Yusef worked by following lines of mortise and tenon joints and by stitching parts together with vegetable ropes, all in order to keep the design as authentic as possible. The Greek term pyramidion refers to the capstone of a pyramid or the tip of an obelisk. In ancient Egyptian, both components were called benben. This word was also used for a specific kind of food, a cone-shaped offering made of bread. The pyramidion was intended to be a miniature reproduction of the pyramid, making it equal to the monument itself in symbolic importance. A few pyramidia have been retrieved from pyramidal complexes. The earliest, found in Dashur, is undoubtedly a good example of Old Kingdom's pyramidia. It is made of limestone and has no inscriptions. Some engraved pyramidia were recovered from private funerary chapels. Their inscriptions all related to the solar symbolism of the Benben. The pyramidia of the pyramids of Giza were never recovered. The reconstitution you see in the game is fictive, incorporating a golden pyramidion bearing inscriptions relevant to Khufu. Welcome to Secrets of the Great Pyramid. Built around 2550 BCE, the Great Pyramid of Giza is considered one of the most iconic structures of Egypt. It is the biggest of the pyramids and the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still standing. The numbers associated to the Great Pyramid of Giza are impressive a workforce of over 20,000 people, 6 million tons of stone, and 20 years of construction. It was a massive undertaking for a pharaoh's tomb. The construction of the Great Pyramid was also a display of power and opulence on the part of Khufu. It is part of the pharaoh's vast funerary complex, which also includes two temples, three satellite pyramids, a causeway, and a builder's necropolis. We can guess that the intent behind the construction of these monuments was Khufu's way of declaring himself one of the most powerful pharaohs to rule a unified Egypt. New insights into engineering and ancient Egyptian culture are still being revealed over 4,500 years later. For example, a recently unearthed papyrus offers a glimpse into the life of a tradesman at the time of the pyramid's construction. Also, a logbook belonging to a team leader during the building gives details on the craftsmen, their work schedules, and the raw materials required. It is interesting to note that by Cleopatra's time, the pyramid's celestial purpose, its construction, and the function of its mysterious inner chambers was already unclear. Today, it is only through dedicated research that we have begun to grasp some of the Great Pyramid's mysteries. The Egyptians had polished their design for centuries by the time work on the Great Pyramid began. Intended as a tomb for Khufu, the Great Pyramid's structural design has been considered to be nearly perfect by engineers and historians ever since. Precisely oriented north-south to the four cardinal points of a compass, the length of each side of the Great Pyramid at its base was 230 meters, and its original height was 147 meters. The pyramid is a mere 0.05% error away from being a perfect square. 
In order to achieve the shape of a true pyramid, the design required many considerations in the planning phases as well as precision during execution. It was especially critical that they control the angle of inclination on all sides at every stage of construction. Materials for the Great Pyramid consisted of quarried limestone blocks weighing between 2 to 15 tons each. The methods of moving these blocks into place is still debated by architects and Egyptologists. The precision of its design in an age with only soft metal tools, as well as the enormous scale of its construction, make the Great Pyramid one of the most impressive feats of human engineering. It's estimated that it took between 600,000 and 2 million blocks of stone to build the Great Pyramid. Experts calculate it would have required men to move 12 blocks every hour around the clock for 20 years to place the 2.3 million stones the monument is made of. While the interior chambers were built with red granite from a swan, most of the pyramid was made from local limestone, weighing between 2 to 15 tons per block. There is debate on how the pyramid stones were moved into place. Recent research is exploring the idea that it was built around a large interior ramp. The recently discovered logbook confirms that the high-quality limestone of the outer casing was brought by boat across the Nile from a quarry in Tura. Once complete, the smooth white polished stone of the Great Pyramid would have reflected the sunlight like a beacon, earning it the name the Horizon of Khufu. Over the centuries, thieves and travelers attempted to access the Great Pyramid numerous times. Ancient writings describe details of its interior, proof that some made their way within, though who gained entrance first and when is unknown. The main entrance of the Great Pyramid is located 17 meters above ground level. It faces north, likely in order to align with the North Star. Though the entrance passageway had been discovered in antiquity, any further access into the Great Pyramid was stopped by massive vertical slabs of rock. As such, present-day visitors to the pyramid must use the robber's entrance. The robber's entrance is reported to have been opened in the 9th century by Caliph al-Mamun. In search of treasure, the Caliph had his men dig their way inside the Great Pyramid. The most likely scenario is that they enlarged a corridor which had been created by tomb robbers during antiquity. As such, this is how the team can justify access to this wonder. Attempts to gain entry to the Great Pyramid and uncover its potential secrets continued throughout the centuries. In the 19th century, the belief that another entry existed at the south side resulted in a hole being blasted into the pyramid's side, with no results for the damage that was done. While the search is still ongoing today to uncover more hidden rooms and passageways, conservation is the primary concern of all such efforts.
Welcome to the Great Pyramid of Giza, Upper Chambers. At the entrance of the ascending passage are three granite flagstones estimated to weigh up to 25 tons each. They were used to protect the Great Pyramid from thieves. Undaunted by the granite blocks, the thieves simply dug into the softer limestone around them, thus creating the robber's entrance. While in reality the robber's entrance is one single cavity which leads to both passages, in the game, the team created individual accesses to either passage. As such, in the game, one entrance leads to the ascending passage, while another leads to the descending passage. The ascending passageway of the Great Pyramid provides a direct path into the Grand Gallery and is accessed 30 meters from the entrance along the descending corridor. Both corridors have similar dimensions and are designed with the same 26 degree incline. The ascending corridor has smooth masonry on its walls and the layout includes many trapezoidal stones. Both the floor and ceiling of the passageway indicate that the passage was enlarged, possibly during or after the funeral, to allow workers room to move granite blocks meant to plug the corridor. The Grand Gallery's purpose is still debated among experts. It may have been intended to align with the stars, act as a buffer to protect the king's chamber, or simply to facilitate the transport of the granite blocks used inside the pyramid. Access to the queen's chamber was at the beginning of the Grand Gallery. Though this room is referred to as the Queen's Chamber, it is believed that there was no queen buried here. Based on their knowledge of earlier pyramids, Egyptologists believe it was more likely intended as the King's Serdab, a chamber meant to contain the Ka statue, which would in turn house the King's spirit. Situated exactly within the pyramid's center, on the east-west axis of the pyramid. The chamber has a vaulted ceiling and measures 5.7 by 5.2 meters. In the eastern wall, there is a niche tucked away in a small corbelled archway, which may have originally held the Ka statue. Behind this niche is another smaller hole, possibly dug out by thieves in search of further treasure. In the 19th century, two shafts were found running through the north and south walls. They each run in a horizontal line for two meters before sloping upward, and both are closed off with limestone blocks fitted with copper handles. Whether they were intended as ventilation shafts for workers or a celestial connection for the pharaoh's spirit is unconfirmed. A recent scan of the room indicated the presence of an unknown cavity hidden behind the north face of the walls over the descending corridor. Further investigation is still ongoing to ascertain the nature of the anomaly so as to avoid risking damage to the monument. Khufu's architects were possibly influenced by earlier rhomboidal pyramids when designing the gallery. It is the longest corbelled vault ever built, measuring 47 meters long and 8.6 meters high. 
the walls were made to taper inward, allowing for better distribution of weight. As a result, the ceiling measures just over a meter wide at its highest point. Though this construction technique is present in other pyramids, few have the same precision and stability. While the space is visually dramatic, the gallery seemed to serve a practical function, though what exactly remains uncertain. Still, the wall design was undoubtedly meant to contribute to the stability of the structure, and its floor may have helped workers move the materials. A channel runs along the middle of the room. A movable floor originally rested in this central recess. The raised benches on either side are equipped with slots that may have been used to help position the granite blocking stones. At the end of the Grand Gallery is the entrance to the antechamber leading to the King's Chamber. Directly above, there is another narrower horizontal passage that connects to the top of the king's chamber and allow the workers access to the weight relief rooms. The far end of the grand gallery leads to a small antechamber with a portcullis preventing access to the king's chamber. The portcullis was composed of three separate granite slabs. They were designed to be lowered into place and seal the chamber after the burial of the king. The grooves dug out to hold the slabs in place are still clearly visible to this day. The elaborate locking system was composed of a series of grooves for the ropes and pulleys that dropped the stones into place like the notches on a key. For the purposes of the game, the team elected to remove the portcullis slabs in order to grant the player access to the king's chamber. In reality, workers would have backed out of the room after the funeral, lowering each slab into place behind them one at a time. Each of the three stones were smashed by looters centuries later, and evidence of their break-in is still evident. The king's chamber is built entirely out of red granite. The king's chamber measures 5.8 meters in height. It has an imposing cover of five stacked levels above with granite beams weighing 25 to 40 tons each. The uppermost level is surmounted by a vault of stones arranged in chevrons to bear the enormous structural load. As in the Queen's Chamber, two shafts extend out from the room towards the north and south faces of the pyramid. They measure nearly 64 meters until they are blocked by copper-handled granite plugs. Some experts in the culture of the Old Kingdom believe that the shafts were thought to lead the king's soul to the stars, with the incarnation of the pharaoh as the god Ra, represented by the northern well, and the god Horus by the southern well. There is a granite sarcophagus at the west end of the room, but it is the concealed construction inscriptions left by workmen on the roof's stones, which verify this as the resting place of Khufu. The sarcophagus was recorded as being empty when it was discovered, and its design indicates that there was once a lid in place. It's possible that this sarcophagus is only a cenotaph in memory of the pharaoh, but was never actually meant to receive the body. Khufu's mummy was never found. It is hoped that as of yet undiscovered hidden rooms and shafts of the pyramid may provide an answer as to its location. Welcome to Jean-Pierre Houdin's Theories.
The team wanted to provide players with a sense of exploration and discovery, particularly within the Great Pyramid. As such, a decision was made that the internal design of the monument in the game would reflect Jean-Pierre Houdin's theories. While the antechambers of the king's tomb have yet to be discovered, Houdin posits that this is merely due to a unique design, placing the pharaoh's tomb at the center of the pyramid. The entire tour you are about to take was designed along Houdin's hypotheses. While respecting Houdin's hypothesis as to the general layout of the antechambers, the team wanted the contents to enhance the game experience. In regular royal tombs, the antechambers were filled with all the material goods needed by the pharaoh in the afterlife. To support the feelings of discovery and awe, the art team created a unique and fantastical treasure in this second antechamber. Houdin theorized that the ascending corridor and the great gallery were used by the workers to haul hoist the heavy beams above the king's chamber. He called it the service circuit. The corridor you are in now was created by the team following Houdin's theory and is referred to as the noble circuit. It is through this corridor that the wooden sarcophagus containing the pharaoh's mummy would have been transported to its final resting chamber. With this structure in mind, one can easily assume that the pyramid's entrance would have been connected to the two antechambers. Modern research has revealed that a cavity might be located behind the north face chevrons of the pyramid. As such, the team chose to create this area for the player to explore. Here is where Houdin believes that the priests and nobles would have exited the pyramid after the burial ceremony. Many theories regarding the construction of the Great Pyramid rely on the usage of external ramps. However, Houdin believes an external ramp would have been too steep for the upper portion of the pyramid. This is why he posits that there were two ramps. An external ramp for about half of the height of the pyramid, which then became an internal ramp for the second half. Houdin's theory states that this internal ramp followed the sides of the pyramid in an ascending spiral pattern. A notch discovered in the edge of the Great Pyramid, known as Bob's Room, seems to support this theory. Located at the corners of each edge of the pyramid, these large rooms would have allowed workers to turn the stone by 90 degrees, allowing them to continue the ascent. The team chose to create rooms such as this one bringing Houdin's hypothesis to life. This long corridor was the first section of the ascending internal ramp. 
Through it, the blocks used to build the Great Pyramid would have been carefully moved upward and then turned at each edge of the pyramid in order to continue their ascent. Though the team only created the main ramp for the game, Houdet posits that this ramp had two levels, allowing workers to return safely to the bottom thanks to an additional corbelled upper section. According to Houdet, the start of the inner ramp was located at the base of the southeastern face of the pyramid. This location would have been the junction point of the external and internal ramps. Below us, workers would have built the lower part of the pyramid with the external ramp before eventually switching to the internal ramp for the middle and upper sections of the pyramid. At that time in the process, they could have reused the material of the external ramp to fill the center of the pyramid, hauling the stones in through the internal ramp. Welcome to the Great Pyramid Subterranean Chamber. From the original entrance of the Great Pyramid, there is a passage leading to the subterranean chamber. Its walls were carved out of the existing rock of the plateau and then covered in a fine unmarked limestone. The descending passage has a steep 26 degree downward slope, narrow and with a low ceiling this pathway is long and challenging. While the original passage was 145 meters long, the team reduced its length and made it both wider and higher. The main focus of the work in reproducing the location was centered upon preserving the unique claustrophobic environment of the Great Pyramid, while still allowing for a smooth game navigation. The well shaft was a 58 meter vertical passage that connected the descending corridor to the grand gallery above. An adjacent grotto may have originally been a small natural well in the bedrock that was enlarged during the tunneling. Whether the grotto was intended for another purpose is uncertain. There is much speculation over the purpose of the well shaft. One theory is that the channel was cut or enlarged to supply air to workers in the descending passage. Another is that it was meant to provide an exit route once the work was done in the heart of the pyramid. Without the well shaft, workers would have been trapped inside forever when the grant gallery was sealed. The opening at the bottom of the well shaft was most likely sealed by exiting workers to camouflage the passageway. There is a subterranean chamber at the end of the descending corridor, 30 meters below the Giza Plateau surface. Dug directly into the bedrock, the space is wide with a ceiling three meters in height. Its floors and walls are rough and uneven, indicating that it was never completed. At the south end of the room, there is another narrow corridor, similar to the others, though it abruptly ends after roughly 20 meters. The chamber also contains an 11 meter pit near the east side. It's unclear what this may have been used for. In the game, this well leads to a fictive underground complex containing key game related mysteries.
The subterranean chamber's original purpose remains a mystery. One popular theory is that it was originally meant to be Khufu's burial chamber, but the pharaoh changed his mind, preferring to be buried higher up in the pyramid, which would explain the chamber's unfinished state. 